without a doubt, one of the most accomplished people I've ever had the chance to talk to. Navy captain, U.S. astronaut, and uh, accomplished rapper. Uh, <laughs> also apparently quite good at making cocktails. So a man of many talents, uh, a renaissance man, as some might say. Um, but yeah, with great honor, uh, to, I'm happy to introduce uh, Chris Ferguson. Thank you, Wilson. I, something tells me I'm never going to live down last night. <laughs> that is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for, for those of you, and I still wonder how Caroline's power of persuasion gets me to do such things. But. So not only that, but, um, but I, I, I was uh, encouraged to come and give uh, sort of a brief update on uh, how Boeing's doing. And uh, three to four months ago, when I was encouraged to do this, uh, I fully expected that we would have flown our crew test flight by, uh, by April. So I would have an awful lot to talk to you about. Uh, well, we have not flown our crew test flight yet. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a bit. So now I was left with this giant void of what do I do? So uh, we had a, a, a fantastic experience, NASA experience with Artemis uh, over December. It gave me a great opportunity to get a lot smarter on SLS. So uh, I'm a relative neophyte to the SLS world, but you know, just like any other curious astronaut and engineer, I sort of dug my way into it and, uh, and learned an awful lot, you know, not just about the system itself, but uh, also how well uh, Artemis One performed. And then maybe we can look a little bit in the future and what to expect. So we'll talk about this for a little bit. Of course, I have a, you know, I have got a, a great um, video to show you ahead of time, maybe talk a little bit about the testing portion of this. Boeing built the core stage, which is essentially the first stage, and then we integrated what was called the ICPS, the, uh, the upper stage that did the translunar injection burn. Uh, they, uh, it was a ULA product, and Boeing integrated it. So that's why they call it the core, right? It's the whole middle stack that gets us uh, on our way to the, to the moon. Um, so uh, you'll see a lot in the video that where we, uh, we, we built the core um, in, uh, at the Shude Assembly Facility in, uh, just outside of New Orleans. Uh, we tested it at the Spenis, uh, Stennis Space Center, not too far away, on the big B-2 test stand. So what you'll see in the video is some of the testing that we had done. It's actually you know, incredibly thorough, I and mean, some, some of it was actually sort of exciting watching in the video. And then uh, um, we'll get a little look at the fabrication of it, and then I'll come back and, and we'll talk about it. So let's move on to the video if everything runs according to plan. All right, let's see. So um, the fact I was given, and I believe it, is the first flight of about 50% of the rockets don't work out well. Either it's a mission failure or it just doesn't make it back. And I don't think that should surprise anybody. Um, by all measures, and we'll get into some of the details, by all measures, um, the Artemis One mission from beginning to end was just a dramatic success, which I think is a testament to you know, the, uh, the integrated uh, team that put the whole vehicle together, uh, an awful lot of testing. And, uh, and preparation for you know, what turned out to be just a great mission. Um, we'll go through just a little bit of the details of the core stage. Um, I realize that there probably are some experts in this room, okay, and then there's some people like me. 
So we're going we're gonna to walk through this together, and uh, we're going to talk about the five sections real quick. From right to left up there is the forward skirt. Forward skirt is, uh, houses a lot of the avionics. Essentially, it's the brains of the rocket. So um, some of you may remember the incident we had with Apollo. I believe it was Apollo 12, but correct me if I'm wrong, lightning strike, and it lost power to the, to the, uh, the command module but yet the rocket flew on. That's because the brains for the ascent portion were, were buried within the rocket and that's exactly the way SLS works. So the mission computers, uh, the single redundant uh, inertial navigation unit is all up in the forward skirt area. Essentially it's the brains of the first stage that regardless of what, uh, and I've even asked, I said, what, what parameters does Orion provide to our stage and nobody could tell me anything. So I, I really think that there's probably some loose communication that goes on but essentially when the rocket lights and it goes, it's under the control of everything that's within that forward skirt. Uh, then we get to the LOX tank. The LOX tank is, uh, and the construction, by, by the way, if you can't tell, is very similar to the space shuttle system, so I'll be talking a lot about similarities. LOX tank, very similar, just a little bigger. Uh, the inner tank, number three down there, same thing. Uh, there is, through the inner tank, there is the, a large uh, thrust structure. It's essentially a large beam that spans from end to end. And uh, when we stack the, um, the, the core section onto the solid rocket boosters, we actually hang this rocket from the attach points for the solid boosters. And that's how it's mostly supported through that, that, that uh, cross beam truss structure that runs through section number three there. Um, locks or uh, hydrogen tank, half a million gallons of hydrogen. Uh, just amazing, but, uh, but the structure not unlike uh, that that we saw in the formal external tank of the shuttle. And then finally, the, uh, the engine section on the back, 150,000 parts alone in the engine section. Uh, I think it really turned out to be, at least for, for Boeing, in terms of fabrication and assembly, one of the more challenging sections, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, in the lower left-hand side, again, built at the Michoud Assembly Facility. Uh, what a historic place that is. For those of you who have had the opportunity to visit that, all the external tanks were built there. I believe it was B-17s built there in World War II tanks. And, and it's actually a multi-user facility right now. So it's not just Boeing building core stages there. There's several other contractors up there in various sections segmented. I want to say it's a 70-acre building. I'm sure I'm probably off by a little bit, but it is a huge facility. Uh, and it, it continues to serve uh, the, uh, the space community. Uh, after it was fabricated, we, uh, we took it up to Stennis, uh, the famous B-2 test stand up there. A lot of you may have watched the green run. Uh, one of, I think it was back in early 21, if I'm getting my dates right, but I've got them coming up here. But uh, a couple, uh, couple test runs up there. You know, this, this um, piece of test equipment dates back to the Apollo days. Um, but until it was reactivated for, um, for Artemis, its last flight, uh, its last test had been uh, a Delta IV. A uh, Delta IV core stage was tested back there in uh, 20, 2000, 2001. So it had sort of sat in a, in a, um, a, a state, but it, it, it had been periodically reactivated over decades for several programs ever since uh, Apollo, but I think this has been the longest sort of um, delay uh, prior to getting back there and doing, um, you know, doing, but, but it was also used for shuttle, uh, main propulsion uh, test assembly was put in there uh, for, a, for a, a readiness firing for the space shuttle. And then uh, immediately after the green run, we uh, lifted it up, put it on a barge, brought it to the Kennedy Space Center, and uh, was actually fortunate enough to be able to watch it roll into the BAB uh, just a couple years ago, and uh, it looked great. It was a, just an impressive thing to take a look at. This is sort of the the bigger picture, I think most of you are familiar with the, uh, with the large solid rocket boosters, five segment, you know, a little, little bigger, a little more powerful than, uh, than those of the shuttle era. Uh, I mentioned the uh, working our way up from the core, uh, you've got the ICPS, the inter, uh, interim cryogenic propulsion stage, again, that's the, the delta uh, second stage, and you've got a, an adapter between there because the ICPS is a, is a five meter um, it's a five meter diameter, so you have to have something to taper that down. And that was actually just moderately modified from its delta function to serve as an interim uh, upper stage for, for just the first three Artemis missions. Um, so, uh, but Boeing did the integration on that, and then everything from the ICPS uh, on up is um, uh, it's Lockheed Martin mostly, and, uh, and the, of course the Orion vehicle at the very top. Uh, Jacobs uh, does, does all the ground, uh, the ground service 
system um, and works hand in hand with NASA, but they're the prime contractor for the, uh, for the whole launch facility. Uh, okay, so let's talk just a little bit about fabrication. What you see on the left is actually the VAB. So that's not, that's not math, but everything on the right is all math. And uh, you know, one of the big challenges Boeing had, uh, and, and actually they changed essentially the whole assembly sequence. The whole vehicle was designed to be built vertically. So we built the hydrogen tank vertically, we built the oxygen tank vertically, we built the engine section vertically, we turned them all horizontal, and we, we put them together, and we, we haul it to the Kennedy Space Center that way. Uh, it was not too long um, before the, the, the original uh, vehicle was to be delivered that we ha had a major modification to the way we were going to integrate it. We, we found that it was uh, very challenging to build the engine section vertically. And you wouldn't think so, right? I've got four engines, I've got you know, a lot of support equipment, I've got the APUs, I've got a lot of piping down there. But for reasons that I don't completely understand, but they decided that, hey, we need to build this horizontally. So essentially what they did is built the engine section onto the horizontal hydrogen tank. And that change was actually made pretty late in the assembly process, and we're going to continue that. As a matter of fact, we're moving um, a few of these uh, uh, operations to the Kennedy Space Center. The engine section uh, soon um, will be built in the former space station processing facility, for those of you who are familiar with that uh, unit out there, and Boeing intends to, to bring a few more components out to KSC to, for fabrication as well. So again, a lot of lessons learned there. Um, looking on and, uh, and what's in the future, um, the, what we launched was called the Block 1 configuration on the far left-hand side there. That's the crew configuration of the Block 1. There's also a cargo configuration of the Block 1. No planned use for that, at least that I'm aware of. And then once we get through uh, Artemis 1, 2, and 3, uh, Artemis 4 will be on what they call the exploration upper stage. Now that is what we see on the right-hand side, the EUS. Uh, the EUS has a much larger diameter uh, to it. It's actually uh, designed to be sort of ta or fared with the existing external tank. So you get a lot more tankage out, it, uh, out of it, a lot more capability through the translunar injection burn, and, uh, and we add four more RL-10 engines. Um, RL-10 engine has been around for practically ever. I think the first version of it flew back in the 60s. It, it's a real stalwart. It's actually when you talk about the commercial crew program, it is the engine we use for uh, our second stage, Boeing uses for their second stage. Uh, they we use a two uh, engine Centaur version of the RL-10, so they've been around a long time, very dependable. There was, uh, as I said, just one on Artemis One, but when we get up to the uh, exploration stage, there'll be four. So you can do the math, right? One engine gives you 25,000 pounds, four engine gives you almost four times as much. Any thoughts on why we might be getting a little bit less thrust out of four engines than four times one? I, th I think. Say it. It's the nozzle. Be because, we're, uh, because we have to pack four engines into a smaller place, we can't put four big nozzles. And, and therefore, in orbit, you know, perfect engines are perfectly expanded flow. And the way you get perfectly expanded is you put a big, big nozzle on it but you usually end up being limited by the hardware in and around the vehicle. So we have to shorten the nozzles and that slightly lowers the thrust. Okay, and then uh, when we get up to the, there is a, there's a crew version of, the, this is the, the block 1B config. There's a crew version of that. Um, I'm sure NASA has designs on it. I'm unaware of where they are, but it enables you to take not just a crew, but an enormous amount of payload to wherever it is you're going. You know, whether it uh, to be, um, you know, to build the gateway, uh, which will be uh, a pseudo station operating in and around cislunar space around the moon or whatever. You know, have your capability to take a lot of cargo and crew. And then there's a cargo only version of it. That's a, that's a bit of a behemoth. So anyhow, that, that's sort of the, the rocket family as it exists today. Um, I wanted to get into maybe just a little bit more detail on the difference between the upper stages. So you've got the ICPS, and, and maybe someone can help me with the math here because it's not making sense to me, and I couldn't find anyone that could explain it, but um, my guess is there's some rocket scientists in here, and you can help me rationalize through this. You see the ICPS has 72,000 uh, pounds of propellant. Uh, the EUS has 280, you know, so rough college math, about four times as much prop, right? A lot of prop. Four engines, 
All right, a lot of engines, a lot of prop, but we all know that the, you know, we're only getting a little deep um, de degradation of performance when we stack the four engines together. But yet when you look at it uh, on the right-hand side, TLI, okay, TLI, the translunar injection burn, how much mass can I sling to the moon, you know, to break free of, of Earth's orbit and, and get out to lunar, lunar space? On the, the, the block one, I can get 27 metric tons. Uh, what's a metric ton? It's 2,200 pounds. So just multiply that out, you come out with about 59,000 pounds. So I get 59,000 pounds, 27 metric tons, escaping the Earth's um, gravitation and being captured by the moon. Um, but although I take four times as much propellant, I'm only getting a 50% increase in mass. I still haven't figured all that out. I will eventually, but I just haven't figured it out. Unless somebody's got, somebody, it, is there a light bulb going off there on why exactly it is this way? It's not is making. But I think that it's all included in that 38. Well. I guess it's it's got to be payload mass. Yeah. It's got to be payload mass. So it's it's the ma it's the mass of the stage yourself. Who is that man back there? Nice nice job, Mr. Antonelli. Way to go. Okay. Um, let's see. Did I get all the? I think I got all the highlights on here. Uh, I left this picture in because it's a cool picture. But I also noticed that this is a Boeing chart. The previous one was a NASA chart. Boeing apparently took a little credit and gave themselves 42 metric tons. And I, and, and I asked, I said, how did we do that? And they said, well, that, this is a capability that we can provide. NASA has chosen 38 metric tons. <laughs> I said, okay, I almost believe that, but all right. But it's a nice shot. Okay, uh, Artemis fun facts. Um, core stage booster, 212 feet, that core stage, right, just that I'll call it the first stage, 212 feet. The entire shuttle stack was 184 feet. So the whole first stage is bigger than the shuttle, which is pretty impressive. Uh, the core stage four, uh, formerly known as SSME, Space Shuttle Main Engines, now called RS-25s, uh, four of them, 1.6 million pounds of thrust. And it, if you add it all up, you say, well, hey, I know, because smart people like Tony Antonelli know that the liftoff thrust of a SSME at 104.5% was somewhere in the neighborhood of 386,000 pounds of thrust. Why am I getting 400,000 pounds of thrust now? And the truth is, is they added a new main engine controller. We always knew that we had a little bit more capability out of the SSME, uh, and they were finally able to capitalize on it with a new controller, and now we also uh, can amp it up to 109% throttle. Uh, versus 104 and a half. So, uh, so why do we get more thrust? That's because we make everything spin faster. And um, okay, um, I already mentioned, you know, 730 gallons of propellant. That's amazing. Now, if you do the math, it actually does work out pretty good. Um, you had about, you, you can decrement that by 25 percent for one less engine, and come down to roughly what the shuttle carried. So. It's, it's physics, right? But we still carry 750, roughly, uh, 1,000 gallons of propellant. Um, the engine section alone, I already mentioned 140,000 parts, 1,000 sensors, 45 miles of cabling. It is by far the most complicated part of the rocket, which I think you would expect, but I think the complexity even exceeded Boeing's expectations when we got into fabrication. It's an impressive piece of machinery. There is an APU, which is an auxiliary power unit, an auxiliary power unit, which actually also has space shuttle pedigree. There is one APU for each of the RS-25s. Um, there is a redundancy capability, a failover capability, so if you lose one, you don't lose a, um, an engine. But the, S, uh, the APUs provide hydraulic power to operate the hydraulically actuated large valves on the engine as well as, as gimbaling. So that's what they're used for. Um, Two Artemis engines, Artemis I engines, flew an STS-135, which was pretty cool if you think about it. You know, I mean, I hated to throw them away, uh, but it was nice that you know we didn't burn them up when we were done with them. So uh, they had they had life left in them. One of them had just uh, eight starts to it, which is uh, pretty low for the SSME world, and uh, and only three flights. Uh, but now it's at the bottom of the Atlantic. Um, the uh, I already talked a little bit about the SRBs. So all right, here's another trivia question. How do I, the, S, uh, the SRBs that, that fly on, um, on Artemis are five segment, 
but yet they have roughly the same cutoff time. You know, it's about two minutes into flight, we should, the, the SRBs run out of prop. Um, how do I do that? I've added a whole nother propellant segment. How do I do that and still end up with the same burn time on the engine? No. No. How, how do I? How do I squeeze? You got to think. I've got to squeeze more mass through that little nozzle, in a in a shorter in a, in the same amount of time. I got to get all that extra mass, twenty five percent extra mass through that. Not roughly twenty five percent. How do I do it? I open the nozzle. So you made the nozzle bigger, and that's how you go from roughly two point seven million pounds of thrust in the shuttle era to three point. I think I said three point six million pounds of thrust. Those are just massive solid rocket motors. You know, add them up, 7.2 million pounds of thrust. I think I saw somewhere it burns like four tons per second of propellant. And I, I could be wrong on that one, but I was like, man, that still sounds like an awful big number. Uh, let's see. The SRBs on Artemis 1, they, they burned out within four tenths of a second of one another. That's pretty impressive. I mean, highly expected because it would be bad if one kept burning and the other didn't. But impressive that we can make them all run out of prop within uh, a half a second. And then they, uh, when you look at performance parameters in terms of, um, you know, thrust and 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 mass flow, uh, within a quarter percent of one another, uh, each each SRV side to side. So, you know, we've done a real good job throughout the years to, uh, and of course it's a lot of shuttle pedigree and experience working with SRVs uh, throughout the years. But we've done really well in tuning these to make sure that they, you know, the, they, they um, perform as the twins that they are. Uh, let's see, the Block 1 height, 322 feet, right? That's a big number. The Block 1, um, uh, the Block 1B, the crew height for the Block 1B, the big engine, or the big um, crew vehicle is 364 feet. And I just found it very coincidental that the Saturn V height is 363 feet. So somebody was clearly trying to do a mine's bigger thing. <laughs> and, they, and they won. Uh, let's see, currently there are four different core stages. Getting back to the math thing, there are four different core stages in, uh, in assembly at uh, Michoud Assembly Facility. Actually, Artemis II's core is pretty well underway. Uh, the question is, when are we gonna ship it out to the Cape, right? It's a lot to store. Uh, and it, of course, it depends when we launch Artemis II, and then you know Artemis III is the, is the planned uh, moon mission. So we, we've got a there's a lot of scheduling challenges that are kind of. But Boeing's building three different or four different core sections right now, and they just broke ground on the facility to build the uh, the big exploration upper stage. So a lot of work going on at MAP. Um, Let's see, some performance uh, numbers. The uh, uh, Artemis 1 TLI burn was the longest burn ever for an RL-10 engine. It was uh, 18 minutes long. That's a, that's a long burn for that engine. I know how, how long we burn it on, uh, on our vehicle, but that's the longest burn ever, 18 minutes for a TLI burn. And for those of you who are thinking more about mechanics, that's gotta be just one heck of a burn arc, 18 minutes of burn arc. Uh, let's see, um, depending on the day of launch, okay, so, I did have to phone a friend on this because I was really curious as an, as an astronaut. The, and the first thing we think about is, well, what sort, of, what sort of failure capability do I have on this vehicle? I've got four engines. You know, in, in, in the shuttle day, we used to sort of worry about, well, when, when can I make it to orbit? When can I potentially lose an engine and still make it to orbit? Or when can I lose an engine and, you know, can I always do an RTLS return to launch site? So I, I did uh, phone a friend and uh, depending upon the day of launch conditions, the, the Block 1 configuration can actually lose an engine right at liftoff and make it to a safe orbit. Um, they won't be able to do TLI, right? They won't be able to go to the moon, but they can do a safe orbit, you know, for an eventual recovery back, and that's with a single engine off the pad. And then I said, well, how far can I go into this eight and a half minute trajectory and, and lose an engine and still be able to do TLI? And the answer I got back was roughly about halfway. So. You can probably lose an engine, you know, about halfway through the trajectory. Of course, it's day launch dependent and, uh, and payload dependent, but you can actually lose an engine about halfway through the trajectory and, and still consider going to the moon, which is pretty impressive. Uh, let's see. The vehicle throttles to maintain Gs on ascent. Now, the G number, the shuttle was three Gs. Some vehicles are higher, some are lower. Um, this vehicle is in the neighborhood of 2.8 Gs. Any, any thoughts on why? 
Actually, let me give you a few more hints because that's probably wide open. There uh, are limiting parameters why you don't want to uh, expose a rocket to too much acceleration. And, and usually in powered flight, it has to do with the inlet pressure for uh, the, the pumps that pump the fuel into the engine. You don't want inlet pressure that's too low or you'll cavitate. You don't want inlet pressure that's too high or you'll, over, you'll overrate the pump itself. So given that, any thoughts on why it's 2.8 Gs instead of 3? That is a very good suggestion, but not the one I had in mind. But you may be partially right. All right, think about uh, the height of the core stage. And this is just my theory, but this is what I think the reason that we're only at 2.8 Gs. But no. How about the column of locks that's sitting on top of the engines? You've, you've got a larger column of locks. So, I mean, just imagine a static column of locks, right? If, if I've got 100 feet at the bottom, I measure a certain pressure. If I've got 200 feet, what am I gonna measure? Twice the pressure. So now, um, these are formerly SSMEs, and I could fly an SSME at three Gs without worrying about overpressing the locks intake. Now I've, I've got a locks tank that's probably 50 feet higher. So, I don't want to go to 3Gs or I might really overpress my locks tank. So that's just, that's my back of the envelope math, but that's what I think the reason is. But you're right, it may have something to do with uprated engines. Okay, uh, I mentioned we, we, are, um, we are building the uh, inertial upper stage at MAF now. Oh, during its lifetime, the core stage build and launch was impacted by seven different hurricanes. I mean, I'm not, I mean, that's amazing if you think about it. Um, you know, some of them were at MAF. Uh, I think the big ones that they mentioned out there were Zeta and Delta. Now, this is back in the year, I can't remember what year it was, but remember we got well over the alphabet and we got into the Alpha Bravos and Deltas and Zetas and all that kind of stuff. So we, there were actually two late hurricanes that impacted the build at, at MAF. And then when we brought it out to the Cape, it spends most of its time in, its v, in the VAB, you don't worry about it. But we did roll it out, and, uh, and be between uh, launch delays for things like LH2 leak, and we'll get to that in just a second, uh, and, uh, and we had, remember, some horrible hurricanes this year. Ian was just terrible. And then there was a hurricane called Nicole that, like, occurred after hurricane season was over. You know, so these are the points where us Floridians start saying we want our money back. You know, what are you giving me hurricanes after hurricane season for? That just doesn't seem to matter. But that thing grew up off the east coast of Florida pretty quick and, and ended up, um, actually, they, they left it out there during the cold, uh, which I, I think, given the forecast, I would have done the same thing. But I had heard from some sources that, that, um, that Artemis One vehicle really saw some pretty high winds during the cold. Uh, much, you know, much so that I think folks were worried that, you know, we made a bad decision by not rolling it back. But in uh, looking at the vehicle afterwards, it was fine. So that's good news. Um, just some performance numbers. Um, you do remember back, uh, we did have an, a green run, right? This is the whole stack in the B2 stand out at the Stena Space Center. We had an early cutoff on the first attempt, and that was actually uh, a hydraulic reservoir sensor that was in the ground system that probably had tolerances that were too tight. And, and for that, it, uh, it shut the test down, which everybody was very surprised, but it ended up being a piece of ground support equipment, or at least ground instrumentation that did it. And we came back a few months later and finished the full 482nd run on uh, Hot Fire 2. Um, launch attempts. Remember, we were out there a couple times. We were plagued by hydrogen leaks, right? Hydrogen is an immensely small molecule. It has a sneaky, very slippery way of getting just about anywhere. Uh, you know, if you look back, NASA almost expected hydrogen leaks someplace. And, uh, and we had done some ground tests, found them there. Uh, we thought we had everything licked. And then during some of the launch attempts, we, uh, we encountered some more hydrogen leaks. We changed the seal, uh, and, um, and we got it down to acceptable limits and eventually launched. But, um, and then there was one other launch attempt where we had, uh, you actually have to chill the engines down. You want to gradually chill them down prior to launch to make sure we don't, in addition to starting the engines, impact a very large thermal transient to them. So we try to get them nice and cold before start. And one of the sensors for one of the engines was measuring um, a, uh, a temperature that was out of limits. 
And I think the way it was described to me going back into, they said that's probably a sensor problem, but at the time they didn't know that, so they scrubbed the launch and, and, uh, and uh, came back in another day, fixed the problem, and it was good to go. Um, talking about the, uh, the weather delays, I think we talked about this a little bit, right? Hurricane Ian uh, and then Nicole, no major damage. Several lightning strikes out there uh, during Nicole, but uh, for those of you, you know, these, all these modern launch pads have a very intricate lightning catenary system built around them. And if you have a chance, if we, if we do get out to the uh, pad to take a look, at, it's a 600-foot catenary tower. Um, but what I always found amazing, and, and I, I, the same with pad 39B, which is where we launch, is even on the other pads, the hole that the rocket has to go through is actually pretty small. I, I know at, at, at pad 41, where we launched the Atlas V, um, you know, I was, I was in the vehicle looking out the window and like the wire for the catenary was right there. I, it was sort of surprising to me how small the hole was. So, um, and that's up at 600 feet th with the rocket only being 300, you know, plus feet tall. Uh, it actually has a ways to go before you go through the hole. Um, so, but anyhow, a lot of, uh, a lot of lightning strikes out there. We're very well protected by these lightning catenary systems that, that send all that current to a, uh, safely to the ground someplace. Uh, I'm sure some of you experience with shuttle delays due to lightning strikes. They have to go back and do a lot of reinspection of the vehicle, make sure that uh, you know that the, the vehicle wasn't over overly impacted by a big current surge. But uh, but we sur managed to survive an awful lot of lightning out there at the pad, and everything was just fine. Uh, incidentally, fun fact that's not on here is Apollo did uh, when it lifted off. It actually did a little tower avoidance maneuver. It actually, and if you go back and watch some of the old videos, you can almost see it. It sort of kicked its tail into the tower so it would push the rocket away from the tower. And, uh, and I asked, I said, hey, does Artemis do a, a tower avoidance maneuver? And uh, they said no. And I said, why? They said, because that hole is so small up there, we don't want to, we don't want to, we want to make sure we get through the middle of the hole. And I think the clearances are a lot uh, better from uh, Artemis to the tower itself and all of the uh, umbilicals that swing out of the way. So there's a lot more clearance there than there was with the Apollo launch tower as well. Okay, uh, how did we do? Well, getting back to the 50% you know, fail, um, I had all the numbers in here and somebody made me take them down, but I'll, I'll sort of talk a little bit in, in the sense of, all right, I gotta light this rocket, I've gotta burn 730,000 gallons of propellant and then I gotta shut it off just in time to make sure I get to where I need to be. Um, the velocity was nearly perfect. So, and it always amazed me, as I'm sure it does most people who have had the chance to be in a shuttle. You're, I mean, you're flowing, you know, I think it's a, a ton and a half of fuel through those motors every second. And how we managed to shut them down precisely to end up within a couple feet per second of a velocity that's really, you know, it's 25,000 feet per second. How do we manage to do that? And it, I mean, it's. To me, it's amazing, because you, you cannot just close a valve, right? Because you're just gonna get this giant water hammer. You have to gradually shut the engine down over the course of a second or two, and, and we always manage to hit our MECO velocity, our main engine cutoff velocity within a couple feet per second. So, and Artemis was no exception. The number that is there is about six feet per second. We were going 26,000 feet per second, and, and we shut it down within six feet per second of a target, which is like, I don't know, 0. .000 something percent. Um, the apogee, so the apogee is the top of the orbit and perigee is the bottom of the orbit. Artemis launched uh, targeting an apogee of 975-ish miles, pretty, pretty far out there. And, uh, and we, we got to that apogee within uh, three miles. Again, pretty impressive. And the inclination, you know, inclination, what you launch into is very important. It's roughly 30 degrees for, uh, for Artemis. The inclination um, was within a hundredth of a degree, probably even better than that, but they only took the measurement out to a hundred, you know, a hundredth of a degree. And that's, that's impressive. On the right-hand side, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, this is the TLI burn. Um, ULA puts, put this information out there, but it was extremely accurate, and uh, you can kind of see the parameters they measured. Semi-major axis, RAN, which is right ascension of ascending node for those who understand orbital mechanics, eccentricity and inclination, and it was just dead, dead perfect. So really, really amazing performance for the first flight out. Okay, how am I doing time-wise? I think I'm doing all right. Yeah, doing great. Um, 
So that's, uh, that is what I managed to learn about the space launch system in the last 30 days. Um, let, now let's go and maybe just talk very briefly about Starliner. Um, just for the, a quick refresher, Starliner is uh, it's a commercial crew vehicle. There are two, uh, the SpaceX Dragon and the Boeing Starliner. SpaceX Dragon has been flying astronauts for a couple years now and doing a real nice job of it very safely. Um, Boeing has had some challenges in various areas. Uh, we, uh, we thought all those challenges were behind us and we were anticipating, as I said earlier, an April launch. Um, now we're looking at the July timeframe, but I, I, I've said I've been confident in other launch dates before, but I really don't see anything between us and July. Um, NASA wants to do uh, one final parachute test with, a, with uh, one of our uh, forward heat shield parachutes, and I'll, I'll explain what the forward heat shield is in just a moment. But I think between that and uh, the closure of certification paperwork, I, I can't see anything standing in our way. So fingers crossed for July. But uh, there's the, uh, the sort of exploded view, I hate to say that, but the exploded view of the vehicle on the left-hand side. Solar ray in the back, four engines that are abort engines. It's a pusher abort system. Artemis had a tractor, a puller system. We're a pusher system. And pusher systems are pretty cool because they enable you to if you don't use your abort system, it preserves all that fuel for orbital use, so that's why they're nice. Uh, four 60,000 pound class engines give us about six Gs of separation from the launch vehicle, depending upon where it occurs. And it's active from about um, T minus a minute and a half uh, all the way, up to, uh, all the way up, to, up to orbit, but we only need those big pusher engines up until about two minutes into the trajectory, right, when the atmosphere is pretty thick. Uh, service module is built for each flight, uh, and it, uh, we jettison it after we do our de orbit burn uh, on reentry, and it lands uh, on a descending trajectory. It'll land off the Aleutian Islands. On an ascending trajectory, it'll land somewhere between Hawaii and California. Uh, the base heat shield is a, it's a one time use, and it's actually it's a jettisonable base heat shield. Uh, we jettison it because we actually, well, we land on land and we, we inflate airbags that are stored underneath that base heat shield uh, just prior to landing. And I'll show you a video of that in just a moment. Uh, crew module up to 10 flights. The next thing is the forward heat shield. Uh, the forward heat shield stays with the vehicle its entire time on orbit, and we just we get rid of it just before we deploy the parachutes because it's protecting the parachutes. The parachutes are right underneath in that top part, well, right where it says parachutes. And uh, we, we separate it by using two small parachutes, it's much smaller than the main parachutes. And, uh, and that's what NASA wants to go test, because there are some uh, abort regions where the dynamic pressure can get kind of high, and they want to make sure that the, the parachutes are going to withstand that dynamic pressure. And then the ascent cover actually comes off uh, during ascent. And then on the right-hand side, that's the rocket. I mentioned the Centaur upper stage, uh, dual engine, and the, uh, the main booster, which is an Atlas V, and we have, they can any fly anywhere from zero to five solid rocket boosters on the side, and solid rocket boosters of a much smaller scale than the ones we were talking about earlier, but, uh, but there they are. Uh, we flew, uh, since we, about a year ago, we flew a successful second uncrewed test flight. Uh, it lasted six days, it went really quick, and that, that's a pretty quick turnaround for a docked mission to the ISS and back again. But we only stayed there docked for about three days and came back. So just by the time we were ready to shut everything down, it was time to turn it all back on and, and come back home. Uh, we have an instantaneous launch window, which probably doesn't mean a lot to everyone other than you need a launch. There is one second on that day where you have to launch. And the reason is, is it's a, a highly inclined mission. And if you don't launch at that time, you have to wait till another day. So you gotta launch on time. Uh, we, we carry two seats on this particular mission with an anthropometric test dummy, and, but we can carry up to five passengers. It's four for NASA missions. Uh, we dock on flight day two, which is about 24 hours after we launch. Uh, we can dock much earlier, but to get the crew's sleep cycle normal, uh, we, we wait and just, we, and, and every one of our missions will probably be that way, docking about 24 hours after launch. I think SpaceX has been about the same way. This was the first flight where we had ascent aborts enabled. We, you know, we had a full up capability abort system if needed. Fortunately, we didn't, fortunately, we didn't need it, but it was there. Uh, we, could, we have multiple rendezvous attempts if needed. Uh, we, have sh we actually protect for a lot of things. We protect in case we fail to dock, we protect coming back to Earth uh, before we run out of electric power or battery power. But, uh, but so we forward deploy uh, forces out to our uh, abort landing site in case we can't dock. 
And then for a normal landing, we send them out there, and the, the four sites are down at the bottom. They're the abbreviations, but it's White Sands Missile Range. We have two places at White Sands, one in the south, one in the north, separated by 60 miles or so. Uh, we have Dugway Proving Ground up outside of Salt Lake City, and uh, Wilcox, Arizona, which is, it's actually uh, non-restricted airspace, so it's been really interesting working with the FAA uh, trying to get in there, but I, we think we've got everything covered. And then we, we can use Edwards Air Force Base in a pinch if we need it. And make sure I got everything there. Yeah. So uh, big changes on, on our mission last May from the previous. Uh, we, had, we had some comm challenges on our first mission. We had a lot of things we had to clean up on comm. Uh, so we had, uh, we introduced some failure uh, detection systems into our comm system, make sure we know if we had, say, a false lock with the Tedris communication satellite. And then we were getting uh, a lot of uh, spurious sideband interference that we, were on it, that we did not expect on our first mission. So we cleaned that all up. Um, we had some challenges in our second launch attempt with uh, valves that had been, um, I'll, I'll say water intruded, but it wasn't really water, it's Florida <laughs> air vapor. And there's Teflon seals in the valves, and Teflon is not completely impervious to water vapor. So it really depends on how long you expose um, oxidizer, which obviously is very corrosive. Um, eventually, the water vapor will permeate across a Teflon seal in about a month and a half. And we had no problems with corrosion at all in any of our valves until we had our vehicle fueled for about a month and a half. And then we started to see corrosion problems. And we had to go back and um, we essentially scrapped that service module because so many valves had been, I'll say, compromised by water vapor and subsequent corrosion. It was a, it was a really interesting engineering problem to go solve and address. Uh, and uh, yeah, but, but so we, we now we, we, we inert the valve. So we actually put what they call a baggy purge around all the valves that could potentially be afflicted with this. All the while we go through a redesign to get new valves that are a little, uh, a lot less susceptible to water vapor. Um, Software improvements, uh, we had, you know, some of you may recall we had, a, we had a challenge with our first orbital burn on our first flight, which is why we didn't rendezvous. And uh, it, took, it took an additional layer of software and testing to make sure we understood exactly why that happened. And we knew pretty much what had happened right away, but we had to go make ourselves bulletproof to that ever happening again. I mentioned we already, already we had the ascent ports enabled, and this was the first flight of our entry cover. The entry cover is, you'll see it in the video coming up if we get that far. It's like a flip top to protect the docking system so we can use it again after we return to Earth. It, actually, the flight was fantastic. We got all our flight test objectives done, all the improvements that we, that we woven in there since our, first, um, since our first flight were very successful. Um, you know, we had what they call IFAs, in-flight anomalies, you know, things you had to go explain like you would expect. There's some of the highlights there. We had uh, some thrusters uh, fail off. We understand exactly why that happened. Uh, and that's all uh, remedy. We remedied that with a software fix. We had a, a short comm outage. It was actually very interesting. We, we had a comm outage at, at not a real optimal time just prior to docking. And it turns out that it, in that particular attitude, the brand new entry cover in the open position actually masked one of our antennas from the Tedra satellite. Uh, fortunately, we still had a comm path through the International Space Station, so we were able to continue. But no one expected that. A very interesting lesson learned there. And then a, a much smaller point, uh, we have an integrated GPS INS navigation system, which needs GPS to be fixed. Um, when you re-enter the atmosphere, you, you sort of lose that GPS signal around the plasma time frame. It's about a minute or so. And then when the GPS sort of woke back up again after plasma, uh, one of them had drifted a little bit and it sort of declared itself out before the GPS could fix the nav state in it again. So it was an interesting lesson learned and. It, just one of those tweaks that you need to get smart and, uh, and fix along the way. So we took care of that. And then the next flight, as I mentioned, no earlier than 721. Uh, I think they're going to decide near the end of the month whether that's a good date. Uh, and it's really ISS traffic model at this point um, and, and the one remaining NASA test, as I had mentioned. And there are heroes who are going to fly it. That's Barry Wilmore and Sonny Williams. Matter of fact, they were in town with us yesterday. We did a uh, some of you recall the acronym TCDT, Terminal Countdown Demonstration Test. We did a segment of that, which is sort of a whole run-through of launch day activities uh, for the crew uh, to get their, you know, when the 
from the time they get into the vehicle uh, until it, we close the hatch, you know, take good timing, make sure everybody's got their act down so we don't fall behind on the watch count. All right, I think I had 45 minutes. Oh, and I used every, uh, I'm right at 45 minutes. So do, do we want to take another minute or two for questions? And, and while we're doing that, I'll go ahead and run this other video and we'll watch as much of it as we can. Yes, sir, go ahead. the moon to put yourself into a um, polar orbit. Do you know, um, is that a significant energy cost to do the polar orbit and have Lunar, la I n understand why we need to be in the polar orbit with the polar landings. I'm just wondering what that energy cost is to do that. Well, they, they do not go into a polar orbit. They do this, uh, I think it's called a rectilinear tail orbit. Right. right. I understand. So it's, it's a very intricate trajectory. And, and as I understand it, the reason that we do it is the service module doesn't have the performance to put us into a circular lunar orbit. So this is a great way to spend two weeks going around the moon at a relatively slow speed, but I think all the way out to 25,000 miles away, and at, without all the propellants that they're okay. to stimulate it. I just heard a, a good answer. It's about 30,000, 39,000 by uh, 1800, yeah. and uh, he doesn't think it's even a polar orbit. So yeah. that could be why. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. They did not do a polar orbit, and I'm not Thank you. intimately familiar with the trajectory planes for the lunar mission stations. Yeah, so okay. The is very similar, but yes, ma'am. Can you think of the Easter Mars flying in front of the Earth and landing on the Earth and landing in front of Mars? Uh, you got the <coughs> rocket already on the Earth, is that right? This rocket. No, I'm talking about the star lander. a lot um, denser and it seems for flight stability you'd want it opposite and the only reason I can figure is you, the LOX is 125 degrees hotter and if you put it below the LH2 you might heat it and force it to vent. Why would you put the heavier liquid on top?
Oh, it's 